Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition. This is Matthew Raphael Johnson, and today is Wednesday, December 16th, 2020. We're living in an age that seems to most people to be unprecedented. Of course, the era that we live in has never even remotely existed in history. The things that are happening in the last year, the last two years, are absolutely nothing new. Even the use of, of disease to manipulate people is, is nothing new, though never to this scale. Today we're going to be talking about a manifestation of this, something called the Great Reset. The nationalist movement is not known for having a lot of legitimate scholars, and it shows. So far, the only thing worse than the Great Reset are those that try to refute it. Most don't really have the background in economics or political theory. Um, those on the right call it some version of communism, which is incoherent. Those on the left calling it some variant of fascism, which is equally incoherent. The use of these much older terms that aren't even used properly in in the right context uh, show that there's simply right now not a language available to talk about this era. The few things on the right that's criticizing the Great Reset is are mostly um, completely irrelevant, brief, and it doesn't seem that anyone has actually read the primary source documents. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight over the next hour. As always, I'm uh, humbled by my supporters, people who've taken a radio broadcast. I mean, it's not a radio show in any traditional sense that doesn't have any guests, that doesn't have any bells and whistles, has no frills, never had, not since 2009, has never had anything like that. Um, for it to be this successful, uh, the tremendous um, uh, draw that I seem to bring uh, wherever I go is something that I didn't see coming years ago. Because it is stripped down. It is just me. But because we're in a um, situation of this huge uh, intellectual vacuum in society in general, on the right in particular, with a few exceptions, so much has fallen to me. Of course, for decades, I specialized in uh, Russian and Ukrainian history and, and politics. Well, given that we live in an age where everything's connected, it's hard for me to stay and stick with that. So many fields are connected with that, whether it be international relations or, or economics or comparative politics or philosophy and theology, and with this huge dearth of serious uh, nationalist scholars, at least in, in the West, I'm forced to go all over the place. But I've made it a point to stay within my field as much as humanly possible. Now, I have a, a doctoral degree in two fields because I was in two uh, fields simultaneously in, in grad school. But often even that's not enough to keep up with simply what needs to be done. Um, and this has been the case in, in many issues. But the only reason that this can work is by the support, both personal and financial, of, of listeners and readers. Um, and I thank those of you who've, who've assisted me. Um, I live hand-to-mouth for the most part. Uh, but the positive thing about that the silver lining is that I'm much freer than my competition. I don't have to listen to anybody. There is no institution that's either giving me money or telling me what to do, since they're really the same thing. And most of my colleagues can't say that. And so it means that because of you guys, I'm in a very enviable position. I say what I want. I interpret things the way I want. And I don't listen to anybody. And it's uh, 
it's a really a great feeling despite all of the all of the negatives. The age that we're living in now, and we'll talk about this this great reset, which is is an economic uh, program, but it's connected to everything else. Is going to make this even more difficult. I was one of the first to um, make fun of the COVID mythology. It was back in March that I told small business owners to simply stay open. It's better to fight these dictates in court than see your whole livelihood fall apart. Only in the second lockdown here in Pennsylvania has that started to, to become a, a mainstream opinion. I predicted back then that you'll see small businessmen going under, seeing their whole life's work destroyed, going into bankruptcy and all the personal humiliation that goes with that, rather than stand up, rather than even begin to fight against these people. How can, how can you even respect people like that? But I'm happy to say that tonight I went to, uh, patronized one of the restaurants that in defiance of Governor Wolf's order, um, remains open. And there's actually a bunch of them around. Those restaurants that have been cited have gone to court and won. The Taste of Sicily was the restaurant here in Pennsylvania that, that was victorious in court. So then what's the excuse of these small businessmen that are, um, that are staying closed, not only destroying their own livelihoods, but those that depend on them? They have no excuse. It's pure cowardice. They're afraid of being called names in Walmart. That's what it comes down to. They, they're not, they're, they're not citizens in any normal sense of the term. And they're not people, it's not much just a matter of, of a disagreement. They're not people that you can respect. And so when they do go under, um, it's, it's the best thing that could possibly happen to them. That's what they deserve. On the other hand, those places that are staying open are packing them in. Everywhere I go, um, these places are, there's a, way, a line out the door. So what might happen is that their competition is going to tattle on them. And they tell on them to the state really just as a way to compensate for their own cowardice. They know that they're doing the wrong thing. These are the same kids in school that would remind the teacher that they forgot to collect the homework. That's, that's you know, the kid that tattled on everybody. Else. That's who these people are. And because they know that they're cowards, they'll try to turn in these people who are actually doing the right thing and defending their their livelihood. And the fact that we live in a society where they would rather commit economic and social suicide rather than stand up against a uh, an absurd and illegal emergency decree that has no foundation in law or history is um, one of, really one of the worst aspects of all of this even though they know if they do it, they'll win. So they have absolutely no excuse. So wherever you can, find out these places that are open and make sure to support them. Give them extra if you possibly can. Because the only reason that they would do something like this is that they're on the verge of total economic destruction. Now that fact is very relevant for what we're talking about because, as I said back in March, and people are starting to finally can get the picture here that one of the main reasons for these lockdowns was to shift um, income and wealth from what was left of the middle classes to the oligarchy. It didn't take a genius when this first happened to note that the big bucks chains were open while the mom and pop stores selling the exact same kind of things were closed. That people like Bill Gates 
were dictating policy for some reason. Now, very few people even bothered to ask. And worse, that social media was censoring everything negative about these people. When I was removed from Facebook as a threat to democracy, it hurt me because I know, you know, I'm out of contact with a lot of people. But then I realized that I'm called a threat to democracy, which is something that I wish I had sent to me in, in the paper so I could frame it. Um, that should be my title from now on, I'm quite pleased to say. Um, and that goes for everyone else who's seen uh, people like Michael Hoffman had all of their, you know, we've been on YouTube for a decade and all of this work now deleted for the sole reason of, of, um, of keeping these, these arguments from the general public. Um, the left right now, as they've really always been, the left's function through the barrel of a gun. That's how it's been from the English Revolution on. Their concern with dialogue is phony. It always has been. No one cares about dialogue in its, for its own sake. They only care about it if they're in a position to benefit from it. Well, because the left really doesn't know our point of view in any detail, when they come across one of us who really knows how to express ourselves, we tend to rip them to pieces. They've never heard our arguments put competently before. All the media does is present the as professors, certainly, is pre present this as caricatures. However, we know their arguments in great detail. That's the problem. They need uh, full control over information. And this great reset, by the way, is prefaced on the complete and total control of information. This isn't a matter of free speech. It's a matter of being correct. I don't need a constitution. I don't need abstract rights to tell me that I have every obligation. Not a right, but an obligation. To talk about this. Truth is generally easy to discern. The only thing that causes a problem is our own self-interest. We don't want to see the truth. And people will use every conceivable kind of defense mechanism they can to keep from hearing it. The main reason that people don't want to listen to us and who attack us even physically is because if we're correct and they have a feeling we are, then their entire world is turned upside down. They'll lose friends. They'll lose their job. They could lose their family. They can never look at the society the same way again. They fancy themselves to be actually a part of day-to-day -day society, that the society is actually theirs. They start talking like us, it's not theirs anymore. They're now outlaws on the outside looking in. We can't assume that truth is a significant category for the bulk of the population, including the bulk of intellectuals. It is not. The main concerns are self-interest, utility, appearing a certain way, virtue signaling, you know, appearing uh, harmless or at least, or even more, you know, helpful to the ruling class. These are far more significant reasons for holding a position, not to mention the fact that the sheer amount of information necessary to have any kind of even a tentative opinion on this stuff is very, very daunting. When you have a normal job and family and everything else, you don't have much time to go over this stuff. So most people really rely on headlines. So, what does this have to do with the Great Reset? The Great Reset is coming out of the World Economic Forum. I've cited from them um, quite often. And one of its founders is Klaus Schwab, who is the founder and CEO um, of the organization since 1974. Uh, Schwab is Jewish, of course, but his background is a little murky. He's not really an entrepreneur. He's never owned a business or anything. He was a professor of engineering in Germany for a long time. Somehow that translated into him founding and creating the largest, most elite um, 
organization of oligarchs on the planet that now are dictating global policy. And of course, they dictate this without dialogue, without discussion, in the name of democracy. Remember what I've said for a long time. I've said it for decades now. No one cares about procedures. Democracy isn't the mechanism of casting votes or debating openly. That is not how the word is being used. Democracy is identical to liberalism. No one is going to die for an abstraction, a mechanism. No one's going to go off into battle and say that they're willing to die for the right to a jury trial. Or, you know, the reform of sentencing guidelines. You know, people do these sort of things for very specific, real, flesh and blood ideas and issues. What you're going to see when you study the documents of the Great Reset is that there is nothing more irritating in the English language on the planet, primarily because it is one cliché after another. I could just picture your your first-year professors in universities pompously talking about this stuff. Um, you know, words like upskilling and, you know, fundamental reorganization and, oh, my God, stakeholder economy. I could just see them believing that they're actually saying something of, of substance. And so reading this stuff is painful because they're not really saying anything. But being vague, in other words, this kind of stuff is essentially one long press release. Being vague is a strategy. Using words and phrases that don't have any stable meaning is absolutely necessary for the ruling class. Everything exists because of deceit. So when you read Schwab's um, essays and speeches on the matter, none of which he's, he wrote himself, of course. All these people have handlers. The committee that put them together will use one cliche after another after another, simply strung together, and the job of an actual scholar or a journalist in the real sense is to get behind what the jargon is and see not only what's really going on, but who's benefiting from it. There's a few components to this so-called Great Reset. And, I'm, and this is directly from Schwab's, uh, and this, by the way, this work came out in June and July of 2020. So this, you know, uh, was in existence long before this COVID nonsense. He says the first component is to steer the market towards fairer outcomes. Now remember, these are the upper reaches of oligarchy talking about this. They do not define what fair might be. But in trying to flesh this out, he says fairer outcomes is the same as upgrading trade agreements and to create the conditions for a stakeholder economy. None of that is ever spelled out. When you press these guys as to what a stakeholder economy is, there isn't actually a much older, worthwhile definition, but that's not how they're using the phrase. Stakeholder economy essentially comes down to giving organizations like Greenpeace and the Sierra Club a seat at these forum meetings, which, of course, has been the case for a very long time. The environmentalist movement has been the creation of oligarchy from the very beginning, uh, starting in earnest in 1990 with the beginning of the global warming hoax. Um, and he says things like changes in wealth taxes, the withdrawal of fossil fuel subsidies, and new rules governing trade and competition. He makes no effort to lay out what this, what this is. Changes to wealth tax, he doesn't say in what direction. Withdrawal of fossil fuel subsidies. These are people who have not only demanded these subsidies, but have benefited from them for a long time. Well, if investment is going to go moving away from fossil fuel subsidies, they want subsidies elsewhere. And the so-called green technologies that they are promoting. And really the same definition goes into the same, the second uh, pillar of this, and that's equality and sustainability. 
Words like inclusivity and diversity are everywhere here. They never explain what that might be. Um, he says, large-scale spending programs that many governments are implementing represent a major opportunity for progress. That's about as detailed as you're going to get. Keep in mind that these are the very same people and the very same institutions that gutted actual state programs to assist the poor and marginalized all over the world. That's obviously not going to change. What it comes down to is the complete takeover of all private wealth in the hands of an oligarchy and then giving a few crumbs to the middle class. Well, actually, there is no middle class, at least to the literate population to keep them quiet. We're going to mention this here in a little bit. Um, he uses the phrase, building green urban infrastructure, creating incentive for industries to improve their track record on environmental, social, and governance metrics. That sounds like a, a freshman syllabus in Business 101 or some ridiculous made-up pseudo-academic field. So ideology, which has always been a big part of this, is now institutionalized. I mentioned several times that the NASDAQ uh, uh, index in the stock market is going to delist companies that don't have non-whites um, and women and others on um, on their corporate boards. At least that's their proposal right now. And finally, the third one, according to him, and again, this is the founder of it, or the promoter of it, talking about the Fourth Industrial Revolution, which is yet another meaningless cliche here. Um, and of course, the COVID nonsense is the pretext. Uh, companies, universities, the state, he says, all join forces to develop therapeutics and diagnostics testing centers, tracing, telemedicine, and everything else. Then he says, you're going to take that, and you're going to bring that to every sector. Now, what does this idiot mean by the fourth um, industrial revolution? It really doesn't have any foundation in reality. Um, the, the theory is basically that the first was water and steam power to mechanize production. That's you know, that's not the traditional um, definition of the first industrial revolution, but it may be relevant. Then the use of electric power and mass production. The third, um, the so-called information uh, revolution. And now the fourth, um, as he says, the um, fusion of technologies, blurring the lines between physical, digital, and biological areas. which, of course, means that we're talking about genetics, we're talking about nanotechnology, we're talking about the, the conclusion, the trajectory of the belief that human beings are nothing more than machines or computers, whatever the trendy metaphor is, and therefore they should be treated in the same way. Now, um, the Great Reset was something that was put out by Schwab and June, July, 2020. And there's a white paper that came out in October that no one has bothered to read. And it's more important. It's resetting the future of work agenda in a post-COVID world. Keep in mind that all of this stuff has been talked about for decades now. Not a shred of this is new. The only thing that matters now is that because of the disconnect, the um, dislocation that this hoax has has created. People are off balance. Their lives have been substantially disrupted and therefore it creates a condition where they could force these things through. People are now used to governments doing exactly whatever they please, taking over entire economies, shutting down entire economies. How is it even possible for the regime to shut down an entire economy. That implies that they have power over the entire economy. Um, 
And this is essentially the, the rough draft as to how this is going to be manifest in, in day-to-day life. Summarizing it is, is fairly easy. Again, it's just one cliche after another. Um, they're going to make as, as labor as digitized as humanly possible. The goal is 85% of all work processes digital or virtual. They want almost 90% to be working remotely, which means that there's no interaction whatsoever between, between workers. This is the institutionalization of social distancing, which, by the way, is a concept that's been around for years. I've been reading a lot of the academic literature on on uh, virus mitigation, starting from the so-called 2009 outbreak, um, talking about face masks and this. But these, all of these ideas, in terms like social distancing, these've been around for a long time. There's nothing. There's nothing new. Um, they're going to take what's normally done by human beings. Fifty percent of that is going to be completely automated. So human input will be drastically diminished. Um, and then, of course, they're talking about this, these, what they call upskilling or reskilling. This is where the private sector completely remakes the education of what workers are functional and to create their, you know, give them a role in this totally non-human or transhuman environment. That there's going to be many fields that are to be considered defunct and new ones created. We'll see here in a minute how the, the, um, Davos Forum, the World Economic Forum, explains how human beings are going to be herded from birth to retirement by the oligarchy into whatever jobs they think they belong in. Personal choice, which is kind of a modern thing to begin with, is going to be completely removed from um, human resource. This is really a human resource idea. But you take this economically and you see what it is socially and you realize this is this is legitimately totalitarian. The corporation itself is going to be wildly restructured. There's not going to be the brick and mortar company anymore. The buzzword now is networks rather than cubicles. This is not an improvement. You're going to hear all of these pseudo intellectual journalists talk about organizational frameworks and obsolete organizational structures as if they know what they're talking about. And through digitization, There'll be an absolute minute by minute control of all activity. Um, and of course, it's going to be the oligarchy, not just the state, but the oligarchy as a whole, um, completely in charge of where people work and why they're working. One of the more revolutionary aspects of this, which again has been happening for a long time, is turning workers into um, temporary workers essentially into you know, what they call the gig economy, temporary employment, going from one place to another, having no permanence anywhere. You get shuffled from place to place wherever you're needed. The concept of employment is, is, is gone, and so is the concept of benefits and any kind of connection to, to a union or to an organization is completely destroyed. The network economy means that there are no jobs anymore you simply are temporarily needed in one place, and then you're brought there, you're given a flat fee, and you're moved elsewhere. And if you're in a, a field that doesn't matter anymore, you're finished, if you can't be upskilled, as they say. The workforce is going to be reduced. They're talking about at least 28%, according to the forum. Um, but the temporary, um, they're talking about temporary removal of workers. They will never come back. 13% permanently reduced workforce. Now that's the basic fundamental structure of what this is going to be um, at the day-to-day level is in, 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 in labor. But all that does is lower transaction costs. It lowers overhead and wildly lowers wages. It's not like there's going to be, you know, this is this is the institutionalization of alienation. In a society that's already dying, in a society that barely knows how to talk to one another, they're now going to make sure that there is no human contact, both uh, as a worker and as a consumer. 
Now, because debt in the private sector is actually higher than the public sector, you're talking $20 trillion in the U.S. alone, everything from mortgages to credit cards to everything else, it's unrepayable. It's suppressing um, the regime's you know, approach to, to economic recovery. There is no economic recovery. Despite what the financial papers were absolutely lying about over the last couple of years, we've been in a very intense depression with an, a real unemployment rate of between 25 and 30 percent, and that includes underemployment. Debt is going to be forgiven. Student loans, everything else, it's going to be wiped out. Now, chances are what that means is that the debt's going to be bought by the state and paid for through the confiscation of assets. The Great Reset's slogan is own nothing and be happy. That's not a something made up. It's actually in their official video on the Davos Forum on the site. They'll wipe out debt and in return, they'll also wipe out ownership. They'll seize all assets, including savings. And then everyone, well, everyone who agrees with the system anyway, will be put on a uh, universe, what they call a negative income tax or a universal basic income. Companies no longer will finance benefits. That'll go to the taxpayer. Everything will be dumped onto now this impoverished worker that has no debt, but also doesn't have a house. Savings, any kind of assets, uh, any real property at all is going to be confiscated in exchange for this negative income tax and debt elimination. The debt's still going to be bought. No one's going to lose any money here. But the massive seizure of assets is what's going to make it palatable for the regime. Again, this has been happening for, for some time. This isn't really debt forgiveness. It's just sort of a new way of collecting. And because our people have no organization, nationalists have no organization in America whatsoever. We used to, wasn't that long ago, but it was destroyed from within. And many of you know what I'm talking about. But you know, that, then that's, that's the chronic problem of, of, um, of some of our people. We did have something uh, in embryo, and now there is absolutely nothing. So there is no way to resist this. Unless, of course, things happen very quickly, which is always possible. Now, that's the basic structure of what this is. No one is talking about finance. No one's talking about inflation. Production, of course, will be pushed um, uh, not even to the third world anymore, but will be pushed total um, artificial intelligence. Mechanization like never before. They talked about um, using robots from the 70s on to eliminate um, human work and therefore wages and, and salaries and benefits uh, and everything that that implies. You know, but, but production is not going to be done by human beings. Delivery is not going to be done by human beings. Consumption is not going to be done by human beings. Artificial intelligence is based on the idea that human cognition is the same as a computer. I have a paper that I've yet to publish attacking the artificial intelligence, um, you know, the basic primary sources that they use to justify it. And they're trying to argue that uh, computer programs, um, sorry, they argue that um, artificial intelligence is really no different than actual intelligence. But when they already assume that the human mind is essentially a computer, it shouldn't be surprising that they make that connection. It's a circular argument. So when you talk about anything like, you know, any kind of personal or institutional or um, or collective obligations or rights, they never existed in the first place. I mean, included their fictions um, and have never been taken. You know, no one can give a reason as to where rights come from, where obligations come from. They have no idea. Computers and drones don't have these. And given that now capital and the state are essentially one entity, that they are one entity, 
they have no limitation. And the Constitution hasn't had any relevance in America for a very long time. The regime does exactly what it wants. The mechanism here, as I've been talking about now for at least two decades, um, the mechanism is the fact that um, there is no distinction between private and public sector anymore. The private sector isn't subject to any kind of constitutional uh, limitations. They're, in fact, protected by it. The only actual functional individuals in the postmodern system are corporations. They actually can exercise rights where ordinary people certainly can't and don't know how and probably shouldn't. Obligations are a different matter. But the obligation is being thrown by the wayside. Now, if you have a private sector that's not subject to any normal political limitations, then a combination of public and private sector, and which is exactly what Schwab is talking about here, these institutions that are really neither and both, they also then wouldn't be subject to limitation. The tight control of institutions and uh, the judiciary and law and the tight control of information on top of it all means that it really doesn't matter anyway. Um, Swab explicitly talks about contract tracing. Contact tracing, I'm sorry. Um, it actually comes from, I'll mention here in a little while, um, a, a computer program developed for tracking cattle, which is deeply symbolic, because that's really what we are to these people. Um, uh, remember, the oligarchy uh, doesn't believe in sp the spirit or the soul and therefore cannot possibly believe in freedom, however you want to define it. There's no such thing as an autonomous computer. Nothing mechanistic could ever be free. But artificial intelligence is based on the idea that there's no difference between mechanism and organism. And they're going to erase whatever distinctions remain. So talking about this kind of thing is, is really a, a foreign language. The COVID thing. Now, somehow Prince Charles has something to do with this. Every once in a while, you, you, they quote him for some reason. I mean, Bill Gates is a, is a billionaire. He, you know, he's, um, but Prince Charles, I'm not really sure why they, they keep going to him here. Anyway, he said recently that this Great Reset agenda is going to, quote, make people more receptive to big visions of change having suffered through unprecedented shockwaves, he said. Um, and then he, actually he gave a, a speech to the WEF. He said, with the idea of being forced to electronically prove your current health status in order to travel or even leave your own home have been acceptable 10 months ago? And of course, he's telling the truth. By the way, it would have been, uh, if people won't, won't do anything about this, don't even understand what's happening. You have people who won't um, go to uh, one of these rebel restaurants that I went to tonight because they think they're going to be arrested. They're afraid that uh, stating a, a politically incorrect opinion will lead to their being jailed and certainly losing their jobs. And that's, that, that, that will happen, at least the latter. But the coronavirus just threw people off balance just enough to get them to accept this, having no idea what's happening around them. Now it's normal. So what's happening here is you're taking this, what already is a breakdown of fundamental relationships, and reorganizing it in such a way that it increases the profit of the oligarchy. And that's what happens when you crush all organization, when you crush all, um, any kind of uh, the, the formation of trust, social capital, so to speak. They're not hiding any of this. When the Great Reset was first put out in July, the newspapers were owned by these very same people immediately began condemning conspiracy theories about it. Well, the idea hadn't even been published yet. So what are they talking about conspiracy theories yet? They're anticipating it. And in fact, maybe writing the, you know, because so many people are so susceptible to this, the regime is actually going to be creating its own opposition here. So you have to be very careful in who you're reading. Um, and that's why I'm actually going through the primary sources 
it might not be as exciting as some of the ridiculous Patriot stuff that's out there. Um, but this is, this is the actual, you know, they're not hiding any of this. This is what they're saying. The slogan, own nothing and be happy is right in the World Economic Forum, um, video justifying the great reset. Um, and Klaus Schwab has made, his, his quote is this, this great reset will require stronger and more effective government and it will demand private sector engagement every step of the way. And Yuval Harari, who apparently is some kind of a historian, um, speaking at um, the last conference that they've had in Davos, said, organisms are algorithms. New technologies will soon give some corporations and governments the ability to hack human beings. Again, if you're not aware of that by now, that that's been in development for a long time, then, you know, you're probably a hopeless case. So the idea of the concept of the Fourth Industrial Revolution is a pseudo-historical, pseudo-intellectual justification for driving the middle class out of existence, of driving small enterprise out of existence, even medium-sized ones, and creating the greatest transfer of wealth in the history of the planet, shutting down huge sec uh, sections of the pre-COVID economy. Now, the video that I mentioned, their introduction to the Great Reset, says that you'll own nothing and you'll be happy, which is supposed to be now the, the goal for 2030. Um, and as they're saying this, there's this happy, you know, kind of smiling face. Um, at the same time, a drone delivers a product to a household. And it says, no humans were involved in manufacturing, packaging, or delivering this product. And of course, it's virus and bacteria-free meaning that they're going to keep this mythology alive. They're already talking about the, the COVID virus, you know, mutating it. They, they could invent whatever they want. They can get doctors by the ton to agree with them, and everything else simply gets shut down. Those who are displaced will be placed on a universal basic income, as I mentioned. Assets will be seized by the regime. Again, you can't even talk about the state anymore. Uh, and it goes to the very same financial institutions that are promoting it. So renting um, and even just temporary use is now called sustainable consumption or saving the planet. And so they're not shy of saying that ownership will exist only in a very reclusive and uh, non-public uh, oligarchic class. But I remember in 2015, the UN's document, um, Transforming Our World, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Um, again, it's something that was discussed briefly at the time. And like all these other things, it's just one cliche after another. Protecting the planet from degradation, uh, including sustainable consumption and production, natural resources, uh, climate change, all these other, all these other slogans. And when they refer to things like sustainable agriculture, they're talking about GMOs. They're talking about the manipulation of genetic structures. Having no idea where that's going to lead, especially with, with humans. Their interest in wind and solar power is not necessarily a problem. It only becomes an issue when that's where capitalism is moving. That's where their investments are going. And they're going to force everyone else to subsidize it. Things like sustainable is one of these ridiculous cliches that, again, has no functional meaning. But it comes down to, you know, punitive carbon tax. It comes down to forcing everyone to scale back an already increasingly Spartan life. But never do the elites say that we're going to um, change any of this. They don't like commercial airliners, of course, neither do I but they don't say anything about their private jets. The idea of the Great Reset has been around for a lot longer than, than the COVID hoax. The COVID thing is how um, they're now able to justify it psychologically. Most people still have no idea what's happening around them. 
Most people are going along because they have no idea what the state is going to do. There are people who believe if you don't wear a mask, you might go to jail. And these are often well-meaning people. And this is what's being taken advantage of. Public ignorance is absolutely central here. Um, several years ago, I think it was a guy named Richard Florida, who, um, a phony at the University of Toronto, um, actually is one of the people who he mentions the Great Reset, um, you know, long before this happened. And he said, the promise of a current reset is the opportunity for a life made better not by ownership of real estate, appliances, cars, raw matter, and material goods, but by flexibility and lower levels of debt, more time with family and friends, greater promise of personal development, and access to more and better experiences. Now, to laugh and roll your eyes at this utter nonsense is easy. But suddenly they're talking about, you know, the great addiction of, of property and ownership. Not them, but us. They're going to start promoting the idea that material goods don't do anything, which of course is true. But the only reason that they're doing it is because they're the only ones that are going to have it. I love the more time with family and friends where they're already creating a society where human interaction is discouraged. No one actually believes that these lockdowns have anything to do with stopping the spread of this, this relatively harmless, harmless virus. Assuming, assuming it's actually even been isolated. It's pe getting people used to the idea that the regime can do whatever it wants to you, can threaten you constantly, can constantly change its decrees, having no legal foundation, and get you frightened of each other. And that, of course, destroys a great weapon that's the foundation of all healthy societies, and that's social trust. Remember, these are the very same people who've gutted the social safety net in countries all over the world. These are the same people who have dismantled governments and started wars all over the planet so as to impose abortion, easy divorce, and training rights. This is what the U.S. military fights for every day. Um, the head of MasterCard, E.J. Banga, talked about the Great Reset just a few months ago, um, exists from the point of view of the corporations. He says, in order for it to work, the private sector must make it a part of its business model. In other words, you know, to be able to make money from it. There is no distinction between the so-called business model and politics. This will all come down to human resources. It will all come down to simply administration. And he says enormous trust has to be built between public and private sectors. And, of course, the trust, I mean, he's not talking about virtue here. Trust means a merger. Governments have now shifted most of its data collection to these very same corporations. The woman that created the um, Chip Safer program allegedly is Victoria Alanis Perez from Ugaré. Um, I don't believe the story that she invented this at 12 years old. It's, it's, a, it's too convenient. Uh, it's probably not true. It just so happens that she, you know, speaks English and is very attractive and everything else. Yeah, you know, it's way too convenient. It's probably not true. But the notion of a chip implanted in cattle to keep them not only from escaping, but healthy, um, is exactly the model that's being used here. And it just so happens that this very same young woman is on the board of the World Economic Forum and is very much a part of the development of these um, of these ideas. Um, as I mentioned, MasterCard USA is a huge part of this. Um, Ma Jun from China, who is a uh, Greenpeace, you know, Western finance environmentalist. Uh, Bernard Looney, who's the managing director of uh, BP in the uh, in Great Britain, um, venture partners like uh, Juliana Rotich, uh, Bradford Smith, of course, who at, at Microsoft, and Nick Stern, who's at the Grantham Research Institute, which is both um, um, you know, Microsoft and Rockefeller. And in fact, that old money foundation stuff is is 
being moved away. And most of them have been bought by Gates and Buffett starting about 10 years ago. So what's happening with this so-called Great Reset, it's institutionalizing things that have been around a long time and giving them some informal legislative foundation. Trillions of dollars that are being pumped into Wall Street and the city in London of money produced out of nowhere by the Fed, creating profits, creating a greater oligarchical power. A lot of it is based on, in fact, insider trading. Because as this great reset is being developed, people who are investing in just the right areas are going to make a killing. These people already know what's going to happen. They're talking about it. So insider trading can't be uh, a crime anymore. Inflation will simply be lied about for now. I don't get the impression that this is a long-term procedure. No one has talked about how inflation is going to be controlled for here, especially when um, cash will largely not exist, and that's something that they're not even shy about anymore. And the total reliance on one or two massive corporations like Amazon or Walmart, done all remotely. Walmart has saw its wealth go from $8 trillion to $10 trillion, uh, just between April and July of this year. And we all know Amazon. These people knew what was happening. They've been talking about it for some time. So the exercise in 2018 and 2019 in Europe about this so-called pandemic, this has been, you know, this is a very old idea. They knew where to send their investments. They knew exactly where to put their money. And it's paying off. That's how they, they suddenly become far wealthier than even they were before. Um, so, but they can't allow a situation where the overwhelming uh, majority of, of people simply can't function economically. They have to offer something. But even what they're offering is fraudulent. No one is going to write debt off. Now, of course, for, for so often, that simply can't be collected. But that can't be done on Mars, even at the at the private level. So chances are the expansion of the Fed's balance sheet is going to take care of a lot of this. And they're simply going to pump more and more artificial money uh, or you know these electronic blips um, and wipe out the debt that way. Remember, money doesn't disappear. It just changes hands. And it began with buying up small businesses at, you know, fire sale prices. And it's one of the reasons that the oligarchy has done so well since uh, since beginning of the year. And as I've said about a million times, one thing that will keep people quiet is an upcoming war with Russia and or China. And if that doesn't succeed, the media will create another, you know, racial issue. They'll invent a story out of nothing like they've done in the past. Uh, innocent black eight-year-old shot for no reason by a cop um, in front of his mother. They'll, they'll invent a whole story. Who knows? And you'll have huge numbers of leftists and Antifa in the street uh, destroy, physically destroying any anything that goes against exactly what the Great Reset is. As always, these leftist groups you th- are at the uh, Davos Forum. You know, Greenpeace, Sierra Club, they've always been speaking at, at these things. Um, there's nothing... There's nothing new about this. One of the most ridiculous frauds that the left is anti-capitalist. Capitalism has simply become leftist. It's largely already been a revolutionary idea. But the old 1920s image of, um, you know, this, this conservative banking establishment, of course, never existed back then. Um, and certainly doesn't exist now. Capital, especially financial capital, is revolutionary. It needs constant chaos and constant alteration uh, in how people live. There can't be any moral foundations, just like there's no monetary foundation. The notion of the gold standard um, means a lot more than just an economic foundation for the sake of some kind of fiscal discipline. It's also emblematic of the basic moral foundations of human behavior to control desires, control wants, 
um, for the sake of some some broader good, which, by the way, these same people denied just a few years ago. It's not an accident. As all this is going on, drugs are being legalized all over the place. Out of nowhere, heroin and cocaine, everything, the whole notion of the Schedule One has been removed in places like Oregon and a few other places. It's easy to be drugged up when you're simply working from home all the time, assuming you're working at all. Pornography uh, and, and prostitution is going to take care of the rest of it. It will create an effeminate, broken, um, isolated, alienated, ignorant male population incapable of anything. And you'll have an increasingly angry, bitter female population that, as always, will look to the third world to take care of these things that, of course, their own men did a few years ago. Well, the stands now, I mean, I've come across um, you know, the studies on, on mask wear have been around for a very long time, that masks do very little um, in preventing uh, any, any any aerosol pathogen. I mean, I've seen it, you know, National Center for Biotechnology, uh, New England Journal of Medicine, Canadian Medical Association Journal, Hospital Infection, U.S. Center for Disease Control, over and over and over again, Atmospheric Chemistry and Physics Journal, over and over again, talk about the mask as being absolutely worthless and, in fact, dangerous. The only problem is is that now, of course, they're being forced to say something else. But prior to 2020, there's a lot of... Uh, and, and by the way, Fauci never said that masks are... I've actually read that article about the uh, Spanish flu. He never said anything of the sort. You actually have to read this stuff before you comment on it. Um, but there are tons of, uh, of works right now that the masks don't do anything. That now this COVID-19 nonsense is... Similar to, in fact, even even uh, easier than than seasonal influenza. Uh, COVID nineteen is even a much lower threat, certainly for younger people, even than the annual uh, typical seasonal um, flu. Um, this has been this has been settled for quite some time now. We have no idea how many people have it. Um, I've known people uh, who've had it that I interact with. I'm sure I have it. Most of you probably have it. If you have no symptoms, um, it's almost impossible to transmit it. But even if you do have symptoms, transmission rate is between 32 and 33%. So you could be living with somebody. Um, but even the CDC, I'm talking about a 99.997% chance of survival. They contract COVID-19 for up to 19 years of age, 99.98% for 20 to 49 and almost identical, uh, um, 70 years and up, 95% survival rate. Nothing is what it seems. Nothing makes any sense. No one believes that shutting down restaurants and, and bars and, and stores and everything else has anything to do with the virus. There is no science that says otherwise. This is why YouTube and Facebook had to silence and take everything off that... Um, said otherwise. And of course, these companies will, for the, for the short term, lose money. You know, the NFL is losing a fortune if they're going along with this. It simply doesn't matter. Advertising. I don't know if you've noticed this, but every advertisement on television has non-white people in it. It's like the country's 80% black, according to uh, advertisers. That has absolutely nothing to do with um, with selling products. But that's not what advertising does anymore. We all know that these products exist. The point of advertising is to associate the company with the ideology of the regime. No one wants to see this stuff. No one wants to see homos and trannies on um, every ad, but they are. They're everywhere. Mixed race couples are everywhere. Every ad is non-white. What does that have to do with selling, uh, you know, Ford motor cars? If anything, it would harm them. That's not the reason that they're advertising. They're advertising for the sake of membership in the club. It's about social manipulation. It's about the tight control over consciousness itself. 
advertising has nothing to do with selling products anymore. And all of this is connected with the nature of this Great Reset. It's an ideological revolution, although something that's been around um, for some time, just in inchoate form. I recommend the book Bowling Alone, America's Declining Social Capital, uh, by Robert Putnam. I've cited it here before. I read it initially in 95 in, in the Journal of Democracy, and he turned it into a book later on. The idea being is that exactly these kind of policies, breaking down social institutions, everything from bowling leagues to the PTA, to church groups, to trick-or-treating, to Christmas parties, this is where social trust is built. This is where basic human relationships are founded. Once you remove those or make them less significant, society literally can't function. But what the Great Reset is talking about is a non-existent society. They're talking about minimal contact among people, at least in a work environment, and the creation of fear. The idea that associating with people, especially the wrong group of people, will lead to the destruction of your livelihood. When you're being, you know, monitored, when every aspect of your life is being monitored um, for the on the pretext of, of a virus, there's nothing then that the regime can't do. They're telling you how many people you can have in your house at any given moment. They're well aware that it has nothing to do with any illness, but people are not used to hearing it. And I'm really hoping that you guys are publicly shaming and mocking anyone you know who's doing this and going along with this. That's your obligation at this point. And supporting people who are fighting it, especially some of these restaurants and other places who are refusing to shut down, they need to know that we're on their side and we'll do what it takes um, to assist them. Anyway, everyone, I appreciate you listening, as always. Thank you for your support. I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Support Dr. Johnson at rusjournal.org. Again, that's rusjournal.org.